Week one. Yeah. All right. Just for close the corner. Okay. All right. So week one, menu design. Hopefully everybody is stoked. This class goes by super fast, but you know, I, in my experience here, a lot of people, you know, put the, you know, the um core class is kind of on the back burner, but Typically, people are pleasantly surprised at what they learn in this class. So hopefully you stick with it and stay up to speed because it's tough to see people fall behind in this class and then try and catch up. So um, but we got to kind of blast through tonight because there's like a lot of just beginning of the class stuff. To cover, so we got to kind of jam it all in here, so we're going to kind of roll through it and I mean, we can take questions, but we'll try and save most of them for the end if possible. Um, so I'm Chef Rich. We have Chef Jose's class. We're combined. And we're just going to kind of go back and forth and switch weeks who's running live session, but we're both here. So brief intro about me. Um, I went to culinary school back in 2000 at New England Culinary Institute in Vermont. Um, once I finished school, I made my way all the way down to the Florida Keys. I packed everything I could in my car, went down there, um, got an uh, internship on a private island. And it was a pretty sweet experience. I mean, super expensive, like you know, these rooms were over three grand a night. Uh, so we saw a lot of movie stars and athletes and all this like really cool stuff. Took a boat to work every day and it was awesome. So when I finished my uh, externship, I stayed on and um, worked there for about four years and then uh, moved my way back up to the Outer Banks where I was familiar with because I've lived there before. Became a catering chef for guys that owned a couple of restaurants there. So that was also a pretty sweet gig because pretty much all of my catering events were just up and down the beach in these massive houses. Um, you know, a lot, some of them were up where you had to have four wheel drive to get up the beach. So, you know, that took a, a whole lot of planning because when you get up there and show up to a gig like that, you can't just turn around and go back and get like little things that you forgot. So, but it was an awesome experience, always on the go. Um, did that for a few years and then made my way somehow up to Western New York and Buffalo where uh, I opened up my first restaurant, which was like a little, 50 seat open kitchen upscale restaurant had that for about maybe seven years got divorced walk away from that and then went and opened up a little uh like seafood shop sort of um where I was selling fresh seafood and then doing daily menus off that um and just running those every day and that was awesome but it was like super seasonal up here on Lake Erie and so I did that for a few years and then got out of that and now I'm here teaching you guys so that's pretty much in a nutshell. Um, I'll let Chef Jose introduce himself, and then we're just going to roll into it. Well, born and raised Puerto Rican, okay? Um, I did my bachelor's in finance, uh, my master's in business administration. I went to work with the federal government doing some fun auditing. Yeah, right. And then um, um, that was in Chicago, right? As I was saying, I lived there in Chicago two years. I moved to Florida, so I left that behind. I couldn't find a job in the field that I was in. I said, well, maybe it's time for me to try the culinary. I, I always wanted to do culinary. So I went to Disney, right, where the magic happens, right? <laughs> um, and that was my first culinary gig. Um, within Disney, I tried to stay within food and beverage, like in finance or accounting, but that didn't happen as well. Obviously, you need to know people to get to in Disney, in different places. Um, eventually, I got into finance, but it wasn't food and beverage. Then I got laid off. I went to culinary school. So I got my, my business degrees, right? So I combined it with a, a certificate or a diploma in Le Cordon Bleu um, here in Orlando, which they already closed. They already closed all the campuses in nationwide. But that's another story for another day. Yeah. And then I just went into the field. Um, but mainly my um experience was in banquets um banquets with uh marriott i did a my externship in, in, in north carolina in pinehurst it's a golf resort um then i went to lowe's resorts or uh, lowe's hotel sorry so again it was just banquets that's my experience um i like to know what I, what to expect and maybe plan a little bit for the unexpected but the line cook life, yeah, that wasn't for me. That 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 rush and that ringing of the or the printer nonstop. Da -da 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 -da. No, no, no. I like I like to have everything nice and planned. And 
and know what to expect. So that way you have like kind of different uh, ways of looking at, at the industry, right? Uh, at, at the kitchen environment. Um, and now I'm, um, I'm working, I've been working for the last six years as a director of food and beverage for a nudist resort here in Florida, in Kissimmee. Yes, I did say it's a nudist resort. No, I don't need to cook naked or my cooks need to be naked or anything like that. Um, I left for a year and a half. I stayed part-time. I, now I came back. So I'm kind of doing both that and teaching. So, and again, like Chef uh, Rich said, I'm just here to share the knowledge that I have um, in banquets or in the industry as an overall or in management. So any questions you guys have, don't hesitate to reach out and um, we'll start a conversation going. But yeah, that's a little bit about me. Married and two kids, newborn two weeks ago. So life is tough right now. But oh, it's, it's, that it's, is, Jeff. Thank you, thank you. But it's a, it's a happy life. So I'll leave it like that. <laughs> Busy life. Busy life. Go ahead, Jeff. All right. All right. So we're going to get into it here. Let me get my screen share. All right. So... All right, you guys can all see this here. All right, so we can skip over intros. All right, so actually, you know what? Before I go over this, let's take a look at the class page just so that everybody is familiar and knows what's going on. I mean, at this point, you guys, I mean, the class pages haven't really changed much, but you know, take a look. There might be some stuff on here that you guys don't have on yours, but you know, some of the main things that you want to look at because in this class, you know, we're writing menus. So if writing is a challenge to you, you know, you got to, as a professional chef, you have to write, you know, menus that are grammatically correct, you know, all this stuff. So, you know, it, it is important. So if that is something you need um, some extra attention on right here, I most of the um, links on my class page, I turned red so that everybody knows where they're at. But, you know, if you need help, take advantage of this writing center and this and the tutors, because the tutors are always like wanting people to come and, you know, get help. So, don't hesitate if you need to, you know, do that. Um, syllabus is going to be right here. And, you know, the syllabus goes through, it's like the ins and outs of everything to expect with this class. Um, uh, announcements. This is like super important. And I think a lot of people, I don't, I still don't know if you guys get notifications um, when we get, when we put something in there, but I do suggest putting stuff in here or checking out the announcements at least like every week because there's stuff going in there um to take a look at and nothing like that's time consuming little videos stuff like that but it's all relevant um and then when we get into our weeks um we have our interactive lesson which we'll talk about that when we go over our assignments but make sure you're going through those interactive lessons okay in this class every week we have a weekly assignment and then what we have is week one three and five we have discussion forums and then weeks two, four, and six, we have a quiz. Well, so since it alternates weeks with the quiz, the quiz is going to cover, like week two quiz covers week one and week two, and all of the answers are in the interactive lesson. So make sure you're taking a look at that, okay? Um, we have our assignments down here, discussions for this week, or this is where you'll find your quiz on the alternating weeks. But, I mean, that's pretty much it, you know, just... The biggest thing is make sure you're checking those announcements, okay? But other than that, you know, on the side over here, we have, you know, our hours. If you guys need to get a hold of us, you know, email address, phone numbers, that kind of stuff. Um, so getting back in here, this is, I think, like something really important if you're not going to take a look at the syllabus, but make sure you pay attention, okay? With the discussion forms, the quizzes, and the assignments, that is your whole grade for the class. You know, coming to live okay. session is definitely suggested, is definitely suggested. Um, but, you know, that that counts for um, attendance, but it doesn't affect your grade in theory if you don't show up. But people that show up or watch live sessions definitely do better. OK, but discussion forums are 35 percent of your grade. And realistically, they don't take very long at all. You know, read it, give it some thought, get in there. but. It's really bizarre to me when we get to the end of the block and people are missing their discussion forums and they, you know, if you have a zero in one or two of your discussion forums, it drops your grades significantly. So, 
make sure you're getting in there and doing your discussions, the quizzes, and then the assignments. They're all almost equally weighted and all equally important. So if you miss a little bit of one thing, it can really hurt your grade pretty uh, substantially. So let's get this. Up. There we go. Um, so that's important. Um, as far as discussion forums go, you know, this is a great way to kick around ideas, right? I mean, you know, when I used to write menus, even when I owned my own restaurant, I mean, I would have everybody sit down and talk about menus and what we want to put on it. And I'm not gonna lie. I mean, even my dishwashers would sit in on this and it's all about getting like different perspectives and kicking around ideas. And that's what the discussion forum is all about. So like this week, it's asking you about your concept. We'll talk about it more, but it's great if you get in there and create a conversation because sometimes people, you know, you might have this, you know, vision in your head about your concept and you put it out there and all of a sudden somebody might bring something to the table that you didn't think about. And that's, that's what's good about getting more heads in the game to kind of kick around ideas. So to get full credit for the discussions, you have to put your initial post and, you know, give it some thought, you know, there's nothing worse than reading like boring discussion forums, you know, with no thought or no passion to them. So hopefully we'll get some good stuff going on in there. And then to get the, you'll get eight points out of 10 for your initial post. And then you'll get one point each for your two responses. So you have to get the two responses in to get 10 out of 10. Okay. So like I said, in-depth responses, make sure you're keeping it appropriate. Okay. Um, and we say, you know, in here, it is okay to disagree with people, but we just ask you to do it respectfully, okay? You know, if you if you want to bring something to the table, be respectful about it. Um, Tanika, you have a question? Yes, yeah, Chef, I just wanted to ask, um, I know it was mentioned to not um, do the discussion before watching the live session. Is it always the case or is that just this week? Um, I mean... You know, typically, you're probably in my class, right, Tanika? Uh, yes, uh, Chef Jose. That's that's my thing because um, I've had it in the past, and people start posting uh, in the discussion forum, but some things are not making sense. And same with the assignments; they start submitting assignment without even um, going through the live session, right? So I start getting assignments on Wednesday. Our live session is on Thursday, so once we're done with live live session. I want you guys to then put all that knowledge into practice into the discussion forum, the quiz, the assignment, all in one shot instead of going just back and forward. Understood. Understood. That's that that's the reason I that I that I send that message. So thank you. No problem. All right. So that's that. All right. Live session, pretty standard. You know, be professional here. You know, um, you don't have to wear chef coats or anything, but you know, dress appropriate. Neutral backgrounds, nothing weird going on in the background, please. Um, like TVs, if you have roommates wandering around, whatever, just try and find a place where it's not going to be distracting for people if you have stuff going on in your house. No smoking, no adult beverages, okay? We do like to part like participation when we get, you know, conversation, you know, going back and forth. It's always nice when you guys talk too. That way you don't have to just listen to us talk the whole time. Um and then if you can't join us, the archives go up, you know, typically as long as YouTube's um, cooperating, it's usually up within an hour or two after live session. So if you don't make it, it will be archived and you can still watch it. Um, and then the biggest thing is, and it's kind of my pet peeve is, you know, I'm here. I love to help you guys um, and I'm available for any questions you have. But my pet peeve is when I get flooded with questions that were absolutely covered in live session. Okay. I mean, we have about 150 students per class and my class is 150 and chef has about 150. So it can be hard to like try and repeat, like go over live session one on one there. But like I said, I'm here to help. But please, you know, take in the information that we're giving you. And then if you have questions, feel free to reach out. OK. All right. So that's pretty much it as far as house cleaning goes. Um, so what do you guys think? You can unmute yourselves because I love to get the I love to hear these responses in week one. And then we talk about it down the talk road. About it down the road. Um, so, um, so are you guys hearing that? Are you guys hearing that? Feedback yeah. again. Oh man, hold on. Chris, no, it was Christy because Christy unmute herself and it's her microphone or something. Okay. All right, cool. We're back. All right. So what do you guys think? 
just kick out ideas. When you think of a menu, what is it to you guys? It's a communication tool. Yep. Marketing I'd say tool. it's like this. It's what? Advertising. Yeah. A grabber. Yeah. A first Some impression. The exactly. First impression. You know, it should, and we're going to, and you'll see more as we go through the weeks, but it should really reflect your restaurant and your concept, right? And we'll talk about, you know, when you are when you come up with a concept, you want everything to kind of align with that concept. What's going to be on your menu, what your menu even looks like, the layout, you know, down to your atmosphere, your decor. That way everything aligns and it doesn't just become, you're not all over the place and confuse your customers. Um, but like one thing we call like the drop test, um, is like basically if you drop, if you were walking on the road and you picked up a menu and it was for a restaurant across town, when you look at that menu, you should know pretty much what you're getting yourself into. You know, is it how you should be dressed? You know, is it going to be this upscale place? Is it a place you could probably take your kid's soccer team to those kind of things? So, like I said, it really needs it's and somebody said your first impression. So, it's you really want it to reflect your concept, okay? Um, when we get in here, okay, when we when we start coming up with ideas, like I said, I mean, you want to come up with your concept, but ideas, you know, when I was coming through the industry, I mean, I used to jot down things on little pieces of scratch paper all the time. Any ideas that came to mind, the thing is, is when you come up with ideas, you never know when you want to go back to those. So, I mean, just the way I did, I remember I had these manila envelopes and they were labeled like entrees, sauces, soups, whatever. And so I could just throw these pieces of paper in there and then I could go back and look at them when I was writing menus because I might come back to something that I thought of like two or three years ago. And I'm like, oh man, I forgot about that, you know? Um, and the thing is, is sometimes you'll go back to those ideas and they don't always fit your concept or the menu you're writing at that time, but it doesn't mean that you'll never use them. So um, I suggest, you know, when you come, when you get ideas, put them down somewhere, you know, you don't, you know, you, you'll come back to them. So that's kind of like what we talk about here, like, you know, with the idea cloud, you know, that's just kind of throwing out those ideas, any ideas, you know, um, and it's, and that's sort of what this funnel method is as well. You know, you throw out all the ideas and then as you start, you know, you start taking away the stuff that doesn't really fit the the concept at the time. And then you start to kind of organize it and um, get it a little, you know, a little more organized as to what you can use and the ideas that you want to keep. Um, some other things, you know, market research, you know, you got to know where you're at, you know, when you're writing a menu or start your business. I mean, who are you going to be selling to? Is there a market for it? I mean, you, you could make the best food in the world write the best menu if there's not a market for that in your area you know it's it's not gonna fly so you really have to know what's going on in your area do a little bit of research when i moved up to western new york i didn't know anything about anything up here so i worked in a couple restaurants and i just kind of was cooking i was kind of seeing what was going on seeing what people like to eat what was like the local cuisine sort of deal and then i and then i figured out a way to apply that to, to my ideas um <laughs> And that comes here with experience, you know, getting in, figuring out what's going on in the town. I mean, where I opened up my restaurant, it was a college town. There was, there's a ton of places to get pizza and all this college, you know, drunk food. I want to do something more upscale. So I wanted, I had to see what people, you know, what was the market? There was definitely a market for an upscale restaurant. So I had to filter out those ideas and figure out what I could do to set myself aside and still draw business in. I wasn't marketing towards college students. Okay. I was marketing to people that had more money to spend, um, were looking for an upscale, more refined experience. That was my target demographic, you know. But the thing is, is with those target demographics, you'll always get people outside of that target demographic. But, you know, that that's not a thing about kind of, you know, knowing your concept and knowing who you're going to market to. That's where you'll find success. Um, so, you know, and and... Like I said, I mean, your ideas can come from anywhere. These are just some suggestions. Eureka moments. You know, you see something, you're like, whoa, I want to put that on my menu. How am I going to make that my own? Anything that gives you ideas, write them down, write them down, right? Um, You know, and I still have all those ideas from when I could. And sometimes I go back and look at them and I'm like, oh, man, I forgot about that, right? Um, So, you know, and when we talk about concepts, I mean, you know, the, the concepts are it's almost unlimited what people come up with. And that's why I love reading the week one discussion forums, because even after I've been in the industry for so long, I love reading these discussion forums because people come up with these ideas and I'm like, whoa, like, man, I, I wish I would have thought of that, you know? So there's always all these great ideas kicking around. Um, 
and you know some of the you know traditional restaurants you can open up a breakfast cafe catering job you know cake shop pastry shop fast food place fast food doesn't mean that it has to be mcdonald's or burger king you know you I, you know you can do really awesome nice food that can be put together quickly i mean when i had my fish my seafood market that's kind of how mine was i mean people wanted to grab stuff i was down at a pier people were taking stuff to their boats it was good homemade nice stuff everything was made in house but we could we could crank it out like quickly you know and so it was a different sort of uh you know concept than like a nice sit down fine dining restaurant Still good food, fast food, but it wasn't, you know, McDonald's. So, um, you know, fine dining restaurants, casual restaurants, food trucks, you know, are big. I read about those a lot. Food trucks seem to have just gotten a huge amount of popularity, I'd say, in the last how like 10 years or whatever. But I even yes, think about they are food. awesome. Food yeah, trucks great. are awesome. They're great. You know, you can go where the business is. You're mobile. You know, and if you have a brick and mortar and you have a food truck, it's awesome because you're advertising everywhere you go which is great um yeah you know and and um i helped open up a farm to table food truck uh here in buffalo for a guy that had a um a uh, livestock farm so that was awesome everything i was getting was all coming right off his farm beef pork chicken lamb duck and it, and he had this huge freezer trailer um like tractor trail freezer on his property so i could just take anything i wanted it was fun so food trucks are great you know um but you know your concept can be anything you know we and i read about them all the time so it's not just limited to this and realistically you know when you come up with a concept you want to be unique you know you don't want to be just like the restaurant down the road you don't want to you know you got to come up with a unique concept something that's going to set you apart from all of your competition, right? Especially with something like food trucks. I mean, you know, here in Buffalo in the summertime, there's all these places where the food trucks meet up and it's great. Healthy competition is good. I mean, you know, if you're one single food truck sitting somewhere, you know, you, you'll you get business. But if you're sitting somewhere where there's 20 other food trucks, tons of people are coming there. It brings more people in. So that healthy competition is great. It makes everybody do better. But you don't want to just be like the guy in the next food truck, right? So, you know, and the thing is with with your concept is, in my experience, you know, it's almost, I believe that it's better to do, like, find your niche and do what you do really, really well, instead of trying to do everything just okay, you know? So come up with a unique idea and think about that. What's going to make me different than anybody else? What's going to set me aside? Um. Yeah, my buddy's got a food truck and it's devoted to like French fries and he yeah. does French fries a bunch of different ways. And then he's also got one with popcorn, I think. I don't yeah. know. He, the, I don't know. His ideas are really cool. <laughs> and that's the thing, you know, I mean, think about that. If you can be creative with French fries, who doesn't like French fries? I mean, it doesn't have to be extravagant to be super successful. And a lot of times, you know, you'll find more success when you are um, marketing things that more people can relate to. You know, when you go to a fine dining restaurant and you eat a $45 filet, you're expecting it to be great, right? Mm, you know, yeah. If you go to a um, food truck that's selling French fries and it's like the baddest French fries you ever had, that's what people are going to talk about probably more often than not, right? And it And more people can relate to that, you know? So when, when we talk about narrowing our concept here, you know, once we come out with those ideas, like I said, you start to think about what makes my ideas stand out? What makes me different than everybody else? And it comes with so that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I was late getting in um, because I was trying to get my phone set up. Um, so is like our first assignment, like doing like a mock um, menu or something? No. No, it's, um, well, I'll go over it. I'm gonna go over the assignment at the end. And get it now, the only it. reason why I ask is because I have a home-based bakery and I'm branching out to get my wholesale license. So I want to start selling to businesses, but my business menu would be different from my consumer menu. Right. Which, I mean, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, okay. we can talk about more. Yeah, we'll talk about more. Um, we'll get into that, trust me. So when we start to narrow down our concept, you know, like I said, who's your target demographic? I mean, who are you really trying to market to? And when we, and we're going to talk about tar target demographics down the road, but 
you know, when we talk about target demographic, it doesn't mean that you're excluding anybody. It doesn't mean that everybody's not welcome. And I, I just put it like this. Like if you open up your business and you had a very limited budget for your marketing, where would you spend that to drum up the most amount of business to where it's the most effective because marketing can be expensive. You know, you want to make sure that you're reaching out and there's great ways now to market and and be a little have more focused marketing. You know, back in the day, people, I remember they would like, you know, print out their advertisement, you know, on like 10,000 postcards and send them out to everybody's mailbox in the area. And, you know, you think about that, you're spending money. And how many of those people just aren't going to be interested at all. So it's kind of just a waste of money. Now there's a lot more, especially with social media and stuff where you can really target a demographic, whether it's like a geographic location, these kind of things to where it'll be a lot more effective, right? I uh, know um, down here, I'm, I live in Columbia, South Carolina. And every Saturday we have this thing down on Main Street. They block off like five blocks and it's called Soda City. And they've got a little bit of everybody down there. And there's some businesses that I've never seen market, but they people strictly go to them on Saturdays. And that's the only place that they ever go. And they make thousands of bucks just doing yeah. one day. And that's like what I said, you know, if, if you have events like that, you know, all the restaurants come together, that just brings masses of people there instead of being somewhere by yourself and hoping that, you know, some people come, right? So healthy competition is always a good thing. Um. You know, like we talked about, is there a market for your concept? You know, you got to know if there's a market for it um, and then commit to your concept. You know, and the thing is, is when you commit to your concept, you know, you're not going to please everybody. You're not going to get everybody into your place. But that doesn't mean that you change everything all the time. People give you suggestions. You know, you got to kind of stick with your guns. Otherwise, you end up chasing your tail if you're going to try and please everybody. And um, it's just not feasible. So be realistic and just, but commit to your, your concept. Okay. Um, and then, like I said, you know, do what you do well, instead of trying to do everything just okay. A lot of times, you know, people find that niche and it's like, um, you know, what Blake said, a French fry truck, you know, cool, stick with that, do it well. And that's your concept. You know, if somebody comes up and they're like, Oh, I wish you guys had this or that, like, okay, great. Thanks for the, uh, you know, suggestion, you know, but like I said, if you're trying to, take in everybody's comments and feedback and trying to, you know, make it happen for everybody, you're going to be chasing your tail the whole time, you know. Um, so when we look here, and this is just like, you know, when we start to, this is kind of like what I'm talking about with concepts. And I don't even, you know, Rainforest Cafes seem to be kind of older school now. I don't see a whole lot of them anymore. But, you know, what do you guys think? You know, when you look at this, like when you think about this Rainforest Cafe, if everybody's kind of familiar with that, like, what would you expect at the Rainforest Cafe? Who would be their target demographic? Like, when you, when you would go in here, what kind of stuff would you expect as far as food, dress? Perfect. And again, who like Alan? What? Lots of families. Families, yep. All ages, I would think right? like island concept, exquisite food, um, food that you would find in different countries that you wouldn't find here. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is when you go there, it's it, the Rainforest Cafe, I wouldn't say is necessarily about the food. It's not, you know, it's pretty corporate chain restaurant food. I mean, when you look at the menu, it's all mm -hmm. over the board. You know, there's something for everyone, all ages, you know, they're marketing to get everybody they can, you know, kids, families, big groups, adults, everybody. So, but, you know, when you eat the food, it's not, I wouldn't say it's anything to write home about. Um but what you're paying for is, you know, you take a, a big group like this is where you could take like your kid's soccer team. And it's great, you know, because the kids are entertained. There's plenty of food for them to eat. They got all this like, you know, animals making noises and rainforest sounds and everything. And, you know, if you can entertain the kids, happy kids or happy, you know, make happy parents. So it's more about kind of the experience of going there. But like I said, I wouldn't really go there like as a foodie, like expecting to get something mm -hmm. exquisite. Or, or fan, you upscale know, scale Chuck E. Cheese. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> upscale Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like you know, it's like burgers and sandwiches and salads and yeah, so, you know, it, it kind of is pretty falls in line with any other corporate chain restaurant, you know. Yeah, we so, still have a Rainforest Cafe here in Tennessee, but it's in Nashville. Yeah, I think there's one here in Niagara Falls too. Um, like I said, I mean, and I know there was one in Vegas. I don't know if there still is. 
There was so one in Fort know, Lauderdale, and, but the food is exquisite. And there's like it was called Mai Kai, and um, they closed down now. But the food was like the lady said earlier. It was a a, a different culture of food, and they cooked it exactly the way they cooked it there in that country. So I mean, I had a different experience when I went to one. But yeah. you know, the thing is, is I mean. This is like, you know, but basically what it comes down to is when you look at this concept, you know, you know what you're getting yourself into. I mean, their target demographic is more casual. It's fun. It's loud in there. It's noisy. Um, they're probably not marketing towards like upscale special occasion diners, you know, anniversaries, weddings, stuff like that. People are probably looking for something a little more refined for those really nice special, you know, occasions, quieter experience. Um but that's not to say that, you know, hey, somebody might have gone on their first date at a Ram Rainforest Cafe and they go there for their anniversary dinner. So, you know, anniversary dinners and stuff like that might not be their target market, but you still get people outside that demographic, you know. Um, but like I said, I mean, in my experience, the food is it's OK. So this here, you know, is this is where um, I went to work in the Florida Keys. So this is a whole different experience, you know, just from looking at, you know, the photos and stuff, what would you think their target demographic would be? How would this be different than going to the Rainforest Cafe? Vacationers. Yep. Vacationers. Um, it looks attractive. like a little bit more open. So it's like open and outside. Yep. Oh, and a bit more cool. money to spend. Seafood. Yeah, lots of seafood. You're on a you're on a private island in the Florida Keys. You know, people want to eat that local cuisine, right? Right. They want to eat that local seafood. That's what they're there for. Um, super expensive. I mean, like I said, these rooms were upwards of over three grand a night. So now you take this concept and, you know, what would their target demographic be? Probably not going to put your kid's soccer team on the boat to go out to Little Palm Island because two people would... It, you know, it could cost anywhere upwards of $800 for a dinner for two, depending on what you eat. So it seems more like a place for a date night if you go on vacation for parents. Yep. This is definitely that special occasion place where people are ready to drop money, way more refined, way more upscale, you know, um, very expensive, but just a whole different target demographic, you know. Um, and that's why we're talking about, you know, like our concepts. When you come up with your concept, you have to realize who you're marketing to and really push that marketing in the right direction to drum up the most amount of business. You know, if you, if your menu didn't fit the bill, if, if you, if Little Palm Island came up with this menu that had like pictures on it and there's color and all this like jazz and, 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 you know, drawings and pictures and yada, 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 you know, you might get the concept or you might get the impression that, yeah, this is going to be like a laid back kind of place. And then you show up with, your kid's soccer team and you're wearing your cutoff t-shirt and you're like, uh, I don't think this is what we were expecting, you know, and your, cu your customers are going to be confused. And so it all kind of comes back to when you come up with your menu, you know, think about the difference. The menu for Little Palm Island looks drastically different than the Rainforest Cafe, right? When you go into the Rainforest Cafe, you're going to expect all the pictures and color and all the jazz. They're trying to grab everybody's attention, the kids, the everything, where Little Palm Island, I mean, this is a way more refined menu. You're not seeing any pictures or anything of that nature on there. Smaller menu because they're seasonal, you know, daily menus, um, you know, everything's made in house, um, you know, as opposed to that chain restaurant where you're getting pre-portioned, you know, frozen food. It's like, you know, um, so, you know, you're looking for on a more refined menu, you know, those menu descriptions to really highlight the quality of the ingredients, the dishes, where they come from. And it's all about that, those descriptions, you know, when you're selling food and you have really expensive dishes on there, you got to really highlight why you're, you know, what you're selling and make people, you know, get excited about that. You know, why is, why, why can I, why can I go to Applebee's and get a sirloin for 18 bucks, but Little Palm Island is selling dry aged New York strips for, you know, $70 because there's a big difference in the product, right? You know, um, and you want to talk about that on the menu. And so we're going to talk about descriptions and stuff as we work our way through the class. But, you know, menu descriptions are huge, right? 
Um, you know, you got to sell your food on paper. If it doesn't sound good on paper, people are going to be less likely to order it, you know? So, and we'll talk about, you know, you know, how to write these and how to explain stuff. And it's, like I said, it's drastically different depending on your concept. I mean, think about, you know, a bakery. I mean, basically, you know, bakeries, a la carte menu, you have everything listed by the piece, mm -hmm. but you have that visual, you know, display cases. Um, so it, it all, you know, your menu is going to be different based on the concept that you're working on, you know, or, or you're using. So, um, and like I said, it all kind of comes back to that drop test, looking at that menu and, and knowing kind of what you're getting yourself into. Right. And most bakeries sell in bulk too. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I think, um, I think places like this restaurant would sell smaller portions and probably have courses in order to people to try to get to get them to try new stuff or stuff like that too. Yeah, definitely. Way more this isn't like I the golden crowd. I would have to say, uh, just by looking at the pictures of this restaurant, it kind of gives off a uh, Gordon Ramsay restaurant vibes to me. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were, I mean, I worked for a chef that was famous in the industry. I mean, we had Ming Tsai come out there. Bobby Flay was out there filming. Oh, the nice. The chef. Um, so, you know, we had, uh, when I was out there, we were, they were filming, uh, great hotels for the travel channel that used to be on there. She, the lady was out there. And, um, my first day, I remember I had to walk out of the kitchen and go across the Island. They were doing the sports illustrated swimsuit issue photo shoot at the pool. I mean, it was definitely like, I mean, very like exclusive, you know, whole different ball game, you know? So, um, you know, it was, it was a well-known place. People definitely knew what they were getting themselves into when they came out here. So, but that's, you know, just to look at those, it's just, you know, drastically different. So you have to figure out who you're marketing to, but it all comes down to, like I said, when you figure out your concept, you have to think about that. I mean, when Little Palm Island came up with their concept, everything had to align with that. If you went out there and you are spending $800 on a dinner for two people, it's probably going to be a little bit weird if you go into the dining room and there's fake elephants making fake noises and monkeys and safari animals and all this crazy stuff. Right. So when people are looking for, you know, that, that fine dining experience, they're going to expect the whole experience to be more refined. You know, the food, the presentation, the atmosphere, the decor, the menu, everything more refined. Right. And so that's all important, you know, and these are all things that we'll start to talk about more as we go in. We're just kind of blasting through tonight and going over a little overview, but we're going to get into these things, you know, each week a little more in depth so that you guys kind of get a handle on this. So, um, but basically, you know, going over tonight, the biggest thing is just when we start to think about that concept, you come up with that concept and everything else kind of branches out from that. So it all aligns together and that way you don't create confusion with your customers. So, um, you know, we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little time going over our lesson or our um, assignment and discussion forum. And then we can take some questions and stuff. And then we'll cut it off there. And then as we move in the weeks, we have a little more time to get a little more focused on more in-depth things and not just like this overview. So does anybody have any questions about that before we get into our assignment? New questions? Chef, you got anything? Nope. Nope. Everybody's good? All good. All right. So we'll go over our discussion forum first. So basically what we're talking about for our discussion this week, okay, is your concept. And basically what we're talking about is, I mean, if you have a business already started, you can certainly write about that. But, you know, I tell people in a perfect world, if all the stars aligned and everything worked out for you, if you could open up your dream concept what would it be? Right. Um, and then we want you to talk about, you know, why is this a good concept for you and the area that you would be opening the business? So we want to hear, you you know, talking about like, is there a market for it? what is the market? Why would your business fit in this area that you're talking about? What is it that's going to make it successful? What's going to make it unique? And the thing is, is this is where we should hear some passion, right? Don't just get in there and be like, oh, I want to open up a hot dog stand because I like hot dogs. You know, it's like, okay, that's like not that interesting, you know? So hopefully if you have like a dream sort of business or concept, you should have some passion behind it and we want to hear about it, you know? And like I said, I mean, 
I love reading these because I still hear people coming up with things that I've never even thought of. And I'm like, man. And, you know, the thing is, is as times change, you know, the restaurant business changes with it. You have to be really fluid with that and roll with those punches. What was hip and trendy 10 years ago isn't the same as what's going on now, you know? And so you have to keep up with the times. And when you're, you know, when things change, you have to be able to change with them with your restaurant and, and roll with those punches. Otherwise, you know, if you're still doing something, I, I guess like a perfect example is this for me. Like I remember when sous vide came out and find out and everybody was like, oh, sous vide everything. Well, now it's like, I mean, it definitely has a good purpose and fits a good role, but you don't really hear about it that much anymore. You know, um, so it's kind of like mm -hmm. a fad. It did its thing. And now people have moved on. If you're still kind of stuck back there, people have already moved on and you're going to just become kind of old news. Right. So, you know, one thing that I used to love to do, I mean, one of my favorite websites was Food and Wine Magazine because they would always have these articles of what's coming up on, you know, what's trending. I would always, my menus were seasonal. I loved it because I, I bought as local as possible. Um, and when you're buying local, you have to do seasonal. I mean, you know, you're not, you know, you got to get what's growing in the season there if you want to be local. Um, so I was always changing menus with the concepts and I loved reading articles about what's coming up, what's trending, ingredients. And then you take that and you you apply it to your menu. How can you put that in your menu and create something that's based around these things? Um, you know, people don't eat the same thing in the middle of hot summer that they're going to be eating in the dead of winter. You know, and you want to think about that. Um, you know, and again, it kind of depends on your concept. If you go to like an Applebee's or something like that, they have that static menu. You know, those restaurants don't really change their menu that much, pretty much because they have all kinds of stuff, something for everyone. But, you know, the thing about chain restaurants is even if you don't like them, um, there's something to be learned from them. And the thing that makes chain restaurants super successful is consistency. You know, if you go to an Outback Steakhouse in Virginia and then you go to an Outback Steakhouse and say up here in New York or whatever, you know what to expect, you know, and that's where they win all that business. Like if you're on a road trip and you got your kids and you see that Applebee's, you're like, oh, let's just go there because we know what we know what to expect. And that consistency is what makes them successful. And, you know, even in your own restaurant, consistency is super, super important. Right. Um, so it can make you or break you. But, um, you know, like I said, I mean, if you're changing your menus seasonally, you know, it's nice because you're not locked into things for terribly long prices, that kind of thing. And again, we'll talk about that as we move forward when we're talking about costing out menus and pricing and things that you want to put on your menu, you know, food fluctuates on a weekly basis. So, you know, that's another thing to take into account when you're writing your menu, you know, and it was, it was kind of tough for me, like doing seafood, seafood fluctuates like crazy. You know, one week you might be paying $25 a pound for like yellowfin tuna. And then one day it might be $16 a pound, you know? Um, and, and it's really hard to price out your menu because with that inconsistency, some days you're going to be making good money and some days you're going to be losing money. So for me writing menus, I had to find when I would, I would write smaller seasonal menus, but I like to seek out items and ingredients that were more um, consistent in price as much as they could be. And then the things that fluctuated so much on a weekly basis, you know, I, you know, people expect to pay good money for, you know, in the wintertime, I would do elk, right. And, or venison. And I found a super good deal on it. And, um, you know, so the thing is, is when you can buy it at a good price, you can still charge what people are expecting to buy. They don't need to know what you're paying for it. So that's what's great about running specials off your menu. You know, you can buy it when the price is right. You run it out, you make your money back. But those things can be hard to take into account, you know, that fluctuation. So it's something you definitely want to take, you know, time to think about when you're writing your menu and pricing it out. Uh, yes, yeah, Chef, you got me wanting to do a fusion cuisine restaurant now based on hearing you talk. That. Fusion, fusion is talk. really big. Yeah, and it's, it's fusion so fun because it just... You can create some really cool dishes, you know, when you're taking ingredients from one, um, you know, cuisine and applying it to cooking techniques of others. And, you know, so it can be really fun to do that. Keeps it interesting. And that's, what, you know, when I was down in Little Palm, I mean, you know, they called it Floribian. You know, there was, you know, this Florida kind of cuisine, Caribbean kind of cuisine, that island food. That's what people expected. When you were on that island, people wanted that, you know, that island food, right? Um, we just had to do it way more refined and found a way to do it way more upscale. 
you know, we might be selling, you know, hogfish snapper on our menu for really expensive. And then there might be a, you know, a fish shop down the road on the island that's selling hogfish snapper for a third of the price. But it's all about, you know, the other ingredients that are going into those dishes and stuff. Um, but, you know, like I said, they, you know, and these are just things that you're going to want to start to take into account when you start thinking about writing your menus. You know, when you're when you're um, writing seasonal menus, you know, you're going to get a big influx of ingredients. You know, when when strawberries are ripe, you, you know, you're going to be getting flooded with strawberries. So when you write that menu, if you're going to do that, you want to start thinking about cross utilization of products. Um, you don't want to just have one dish that has strawberries in or one dessert. You know, if you're buying local fresh strawberries, you know, put them all over the place on your menu. You know, buy them up when the when they're right, when people want to eat them, and when the season's out, you you know you 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 move on to the next thing that's in season. So, um, Sabrina, you have a question? Yes. So dealing with the discussion uh, and the whole concept, me and my mom have started a business type deal. Um, could I use our business that we started as a concept idea? Yep, absolutely. Like I said, if you have a business already going or something in the works, tell us about it. We want to hear about it. All righty. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Well, you, might, you might get other ideas for your concept. Or exactly. And that's what I'm saying. You know, if you put that concept out there that you and your mom are starting, Put it out there and you might have somebody say, hey, that sounds awesome. Have you ever thought of this too? And you might be like, oh man, I never thought about that. Yeah, we should definitely do that within our concept. So as I said, I mean, ideas are born, you know, when, when you get more heads in the room and more different perspectives. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, like I said, I mean, when I would sit down, I would even have my dishwasher and some of the things that he would come up with sounded kind of silly, but all of a sudden you'd be like, hey, that actually sounds good. How can we, how can we tweak that and get it to fit our concept, you know? Um, so it's always a good idea to kick around ideas with as many people as you can. And that's what these discussions are about. So whatever you're doing, whatever you think about, put it out there, create a discussion, see what people think about it. You know, what is everybody's response going to be? You know, if you, if you get, you know, a lot of positive feedback and ideas, that's great. If you get people saying, ah, it sounds good, but you know, I don't know, have you thought about this? This might not work or this might not be a big, you know, that's always, that's also great feedback. You know, you have to be humble enough to take constructive criticism as a chef, you know, whether it's, you know, staff and, you know, people that are trying to give you ideas all the way down to your customers. I mean, you have to listen to what your customers want. You know, there was plenty of times where I'd write menus and I would put dishes on there that I was like, oh, this is going to be great. This is awesome. And it just wouldn't sell, you know, or people just weren't interested in it. And so, you know, you have to step back and, and, you know, when you're writing your menus and you're a professional chef, you also got to keep in mind that you're not just cooking for yourself anymore. You know, you might make the best whatever and your family loves it when you come over and cook it and everybody wants you to make it all the time. You know, like when you come to family get togethers, but it might not fit your concept on your, on your, uh, you know, on your, or fit on your menu for your concept. So you have to keep that in mind. You're not cooking for just yourself anymore. And you're, you know, your mom might say, oh, you make the best this and that. That's great. Mom likes it. But if there's not a market for it, it doesn't matter what mom likes, you know, save that for mom and make sure that you're cooking for, you know, your customers. You're in business now, you know, you're a chef and really what it comes down to is you want to make money, right? And so, you know, getting feedback and listening to your customers. I mean, that's, that's, you know, I read this article one time um, and basically it was kind of funny because as you saw, you know, restaurants, it, you know, um, starting to become more popular and food becoming real popular and trendy and stuff. Um, it just, I mean, you know, I don't know. It's, a, you, you know, you come up with ideas, but you have to be realistic about them, you know, and, and, and be reasonable about it. I had an open kitchen. I got a lot of feedback from my customers. They were always trying to give me feedback and give me ideas and stuff. I'm like, all right, yep, yep, yep. Got it, got it, got it. Sometimes I would apply it if it made sense. And um, sometimes you just want to make them heard. But like I said, you can't, you know, um, if you try to make everybody happy, you're going to be chasing your tail. So, Chef, you got some? Just to add about the discussion forum, just, yes, it is a task. It's a, it is part, part of the assignment, but use it as a tool. Like we've been saying, bounce ideas amongst yourself, amongst your peers. Who knows? You might end up with a partnership with somebody because they have the same idea or something crazy like that, right? That So just don't look at just as an assignment, but as a tool as well um, to just brainstorm. Like Chef said, he, he got his team together. 
think that you're an entire uh, team in the restaurant. You have full, a front of house, back of house, brainstorm ideas, um, and just yeah, go for it. Don't don't hold back. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of the things in this class are, you know, like the discussions, there's not really a right or wrong answer. You know, it's, exactly. it's, it's about the why, you know, come up with your concept. It's, it's about the why, you know, mm -hmm. and um, most of this class, there's not really right or wrong answers. It's more about the why that you don't. And we, that's really what we're hearing. We want to hear about. The okay? entire class is going to be why. Okay. But why don't just answer yeah. it, but why? <laughs> Like I said, don't just say I'm opening up a hot dog stand because I like hot dogs. You know, that's not like, okay, right? Uh, Sharice, you have a question? Yes. Um, I was intimidated when I first started this class because, A, I'm fresh at this thing, but I've been doing, um, working with cannabis for like four years. Nope. And I make everything by hand. And I actually made like several different menus. I thought I was doing something wrong because I'm really self-taught. But listening to you explain the menu, I had to tweak it a whole bunch of times just to go with the people that I was serving to. I served to different type of fields, like um, people with sicknesses. Yep. I served to young people and then different things. So this is going to be an awesome class. I was a, I was intimidated very well because of the literature about it. But thank you, chefs. Great explanation. And the yep. thing is, is, you know, it's real. I mean, this class could take up a whole lot more time. You know, there's so much to talk about. The bottom line is writing a menu. You know, it's a skill. You know, it. The more you do it, the better you're going to get. And it's certainly not this expectation in this class that after the six weeks, you're going to be able to go out and write a perfect menu, right? We're going to give you the tools to start get the wheels turning and you're going to start to notice things about menus and start to think about things with these menus. Um, but like I said, I mean, when I look back at when I opened my first restaurant, when I look back at the menus that I wrote the first year, they looked drastically different than six or seven years down the road, you know? Um, and that's just getting better at writing menus. That's getting you know, more in tune with my concept, your market, all these things. So, you know, if you write a, a menu and it's, and it doesn't work out like you totally expect it to, that's okay. You know, it's, it's a process to get better at it. And it takes practice. Um, and we'll talk about too, like ways that you can kind of improve writing menus and get, you know, better at it. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I always tell people, and it might sound funny, but just start out like every time, like if you have a family, you're cooking for somebody, even if you're cooking for yourself, every time you cook at home, just see if you can come up, like to explain it on paper, what you just made and see and describe it, you know, and that's where you start to, you know, get better at it with practice, you know, look up things, you know, if you, if you love a dish that you would want to put up on your menu, do a little research, look up other restaurants that have them, see the way they word it, you know, how do they talk about it? Um, like I said, I mean, if it doesn't sound awesome on paper, it's probably less likely to sell. Um, Don. Um, yeah, so I've, I've made menus plenty of times with um, my business, but is it helpful because like I do specialty cakes and like 3D custom cakes and stuff, but I also have like a set menu, like for seasons I do um, Christmas, I do certain things and Thanksgiving and I go with the holidays. So I always explain it out like to the T, like it's a four layer cake with this, 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 and this. Should I keep it like that or just be like short, simple, sweet, and it be self-explanatory? I mean, you know, realistically, it kind of depends on your market. I mean, I like um, shorter descriptions. I like just the kind of the key words, you know, the cliff notes, you know, about what's in it. Um, but also, you know, I like smaller menus, but a good example is like, look at the Cheesecake Factory. I mean, they have like a, it's like 50 pages long. I don't particularly like that, but it's super successful for them. So it really comes- I'm not that long. It's only like two pages. That's because I offer like cakes, cookies, muffins. Um, yeah, it's not that extreme, but yeah. yeah. But, but you know, you want to give a good description, you know, that's what's going to sell your food. Do you have to write a like you know a paragraph about each item? Not necessarily, and it also depends. I mean, think about if you go into a concept like an Applebee's, where the wait staff is just kind of there to turn tables and make money. Um, that's going to be a whole different caliber than 
you know, servers that are working in a white tablecloth fine dining restaurant. Um, you're probably going to have bigger menu descriptions on the Applebee's menu because the servers are just there to drop food and go to the next table. Where when you go to a fine dining restaurant, you know, you're going to be looking at more like different, a whole different ball game with ingredients and cooking techniques, all this stuff. So, you know, I like, you know, on an upscale restaurant, I like that brief description. It gives you like the key ingredients, the cooking technique, how it's made. Um, but then you have a, a very informative service staff that takes time at the table to answer those questions and they can also describe those dishes. So it also comes down to, you know, how your staff is trained, you know, can, if they're informative, you know, you can back off on that menu description a little bit um, and it creates that experience, you know? So, um, Blake. Yeah, I was going to say, um, and I sent you a message about this earlier, but I studied nutrition when I was in college. I actually went to school to be a dietitian. Oh, nice. And I have wrote menus for people with celiac disease, diabetes, renal disease. And if you think regular menu, menu planning is a challenge, try doing that. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. And, you know, think, you know, it's, and that's, you know, that's, think about those concepts. I mean, you know, that's a niche in itself. You know, you're marketing to people that have those, um, you know, um, dietary restrictions and stuff. So, if that's your your you know your your demographic, your menu is going to look a lot different, you know, and you're going to have to provide different sort of information that's going to be important to your customers on those menus, you know. So, um, Chris, Crystal Lee, um, what if you want to do catering or like um, private chef? Well, you know, when you do stuff like that, I mean. I would, you know, when you get into that kind of business, you know, it's nice to have maybe a couple sample menus. Um, but in my experience with catering, you know, a lot of that's all custom, you know, you, you know, I would sit down with my customers and I would go over what they were interested in. And then I would come up with a couple different menus based on what their interests were and then do the food ordering, you know, and that, that's what's cool because every gig was different, you know, what people want, you know, it's not a one size fits all kind of deal. There are catering businesses that do that. They might give you like five different menus to pick from and that's all you get. So again, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it all depends on the situation, you know, what you're trying to sell, what you're trying to do as us, you know, with me catering, you know, again, it was, I wasn't doing, you know, 500 person banquets. I was doing upscale dinners for way less people, smaller, more refined at their home. So they wanted to have that, um, ability to kind of kick out their ideas to me and then have me create a menu for them. Okay. So um, it all depends on the situation and who you're marketing to. Um, if that makes sense. And like I said, you know, it's kind of hard because like I said, I mean, here there's no right or wrong answer. What fit for my concept in my restaurant didn't work for others and vice versa. So that's what, that's when you have to start to, you know, and we're going to go over things. You have to, you know, commit to that concept. You have to look at your market. Who are you selling to? And that's going to sway all of this stuff one way or another. Okay. It's not a one size fits all thing. And um, once you start to look at menus in this class, you're going to realize that, you know, one style of menu may apply here, but it doesn't work for somewhere else. Okay. Um, you know, if you're doing 500 plus person banquets, then you have to, you know, those menus, it, you know, that it's, you know, those numbers, they want to know what those numbers are. So you want to manage those numbers a lot more with those big dinners. So, you know, having set menus for stuff like that makes it easier to manage those numbers. Okay. Um, and with product and all that stuff, what's going to be on your menu. If I'm doing a, a upscale dinner for like $150 a person um, and they want like local cuisine and stuff like this, um, that menu is going to look different than, you know, showing up at a, a banquet facility that, you know, was doing just nothing but weddings. I was doing all kinds of different uh, sort of occasions for people at, at homes and stuff. So again, you know, what I was doing, it wasn't a one size fits all. People wanted it to be a unique experience and that's what we did for them. And they were willing to pay for that unique experience, you know, and the more unique you can make it, the more you can, um, you know, customize it to them, you know, you can start charging more money for that. So do you want to turn and burn or do you want to create like a really memorable experience? You know, there's definitely a big difference when you go to a wedding and you get like killer, awesome food and it's smaller and it's, you know, all those details as opposed to going to, um, 
you know, a 500 person wedding and it's a buffet, you know, and, and so you have to take into account, there's nothing wrong with buffets. You can still do really nice buffets, but when, if you're thinking about doing a buffet, you also have to think about is that food, it does it have to be held hot? How long can it be held hot before it's ruined and all these things, you know? So when you're thinking about all these, it, there's just so many things that start to come into play and you have to take all these into consideration when you write your menu, you know, um, plating up 500 dinners, the logistics of it is way different than a more unique, smaller sort of upscale experience, you know? So it all depends. And like I said, you guys, as we keep going through this class, people always get done with this class and they're like, wow, you know, I, I totally look at menus differently and, you know, it's, and, and it just really gets your wheels turning for sure. Um, all right. So for our assignment, does anybody else have any question about the discussion before we move into the assignment? Okay. Um, all right. So our assignment, when you go onto the assignment, you click on that, access the link here in red so what you're going to do with all of our assignments your weekly assignments they're going to be on a document right google doc so what you're going to want to do is you're going to click on make a copy okay and it's going to come up with what you're going to write on and some people still like to just create their own google doc and put it into a folder but you can also just keep make life easy and you can type right on this document okay put all your answers here and I'll show you how to submit it the easiest way I know how if you want to just do it this way. But for this, okay, please hear this because people, I, I go over this and I try to tell everybody, but we always get the same mistakes. The, what we're doing is we're thinking about these three different concepts. I am sure, 100% sure, if you Google a restaurant called the Golden Eagle or the Trinity or Mia's, you will find plenty of restaurants with those names. Don't do that, okay? All we're concerned about is this fake name of a restaurant. It's all about the concept, okay? And what you're going to be using is your imagination here and talking about what you would expect if you went in to a place with this concept, okay? And you're going to answer the same three questions for each one, okay? What type of menu would each use and why? We, okay, the second question is what items or dishes, some example dishes would you see on this menu? What we're talking about when we say what type of menu, you know, is it going to be a static menu? Is it a chalkboard menu? Is it this or that? Whatever, you know, style of menu. The second question, you know, because like if you go into a bakery, I would expect, you know, a big chalkboard menu or something like that. I wouldn't expect a chalkboard menu walking into a white tablecloth fine dining restaurant. Okay. So that's your first, you know, question. There's going to be a big difference between this Golden Eagle fast casual American style restaurant. And every time when I'm grading these, you know, my mind, when I think about a fast, casual American style restaurant, I go straight, my mind goes straight to any family friendly restaurant, chain restaurant, that kind of thing, right? Um, whether it could be like a Denny's, an Applebee's, a diner, uh, anything, right? But fast, casual American style, whatever that means to you, if you've ever been into a place like that, what what, it, what did it look like to you, right? So what did, what kind of style of menu did they have? Give us some examples of dishes because, again, they're going to be drastically different, you know, for each different concept. What kind of food would you expect to find? And then we're going to talk about in what ways, you know, what would the decor, the atmosphere, that kind of stuff look like in the restaurant? So, like I said, I mean, just as an example, an Applebee's, you know, what type of menu would you expect? I would expect a static menu, a menu with a lot of pictures, a lot of color, all that jazz, right? Big variety. All that kind of stuff. Marketing to get anybody and everybody they can through the door of all ages. A few items that I would expect to see, you know, um, steaks, seafood, pasta, you know, um, apps, kids food, all that kind of stuff. Mention some of those dishes that you would expect to see there. Um, you know, when you start to talk about Trinity, this fine dining restaurant, obviously these dishes are going to look a lot different than what you would expect in like a chain restaurant. So talk about that. What kind of dishes would you see? Ingredients that it would be on the menu, that kind of thing, right? And then down here, you know, Mia's, this is, and just make sure you, you look at the, you know, all the time I get people, Mia's, oh, I would expect this to be like a pasta house and spaghetti and this and that. It's like, nope, not at all. You know, I'm sure that there's plenty of Italian restaurants named Mia's, but here we're talking about a pastry shop. You know, what kind, what was a pastry shop look like when you walk into it? So again, there's not really a, necessarily a right or wrong answer but as long as it's kind of within that concept right 
I wouldn't expect to see dry aged um, New York strip steaks at the fast casual American style restaurant. Um, right. So keep that all in mind. And like I said, it's really just your imagination. Give it some thought and put yourself in that, you know, what's the decor look like in Applebee's? There's stuff all over the wall. There's a bar, there's TVs, there's sports, there's this and that. When I go into a fine dining restaurant, I'm definitely not expecting to see TVs, sports, that kind of stuff, you know, doesn't fit the bill anymore. So does everybody understand? Right. Blake, you got, you got something? Oh, no, I'm okay, chef. Oh, okay. You're hearing up. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so would the, do we need to name like the restaurant that nope. we would think it would be just what nope. we think it is? Just what you think. Okay. It is. Yep. Okay. So like I said, when you go on here, you, you know, you can click your cursor, put your answer, yada, 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 yada. Okay. Once you get it all filled out and there's numerous ways to get from point A to point B here, I am about as far behind in tech, technology, like computer stuff is not my gig. So whenever I give you guys the example, this is just the easiest way that I would do it. But, you know, if you, you know, you might have a different way, as long as we can get this information, like I said, some people will still put it in their folders, but the easiest way I can tell you to do this is once you get it all typed up, go up here into the corner to the share button. Okay. When you click on that, it's going to, you're, what you're going to do is grab the link for this document and you're just going to put the link in your assignment. Uh, submission. So what you want to do, this is key right here, this restricted. What you have to do is when you go in to share this, you have to get this drop down and make sure that you go to anyone with the link can view. If it says, if you leave it at restricted, we won't be able to open it. We're going to have to send your assignment back and you're going to have to fix it. Not that it's the end of the world, but it just makes it easier when it's right the first time. So what you're going to do is go to anyone with the link can view it. You click on that. Okay. And then what you do is just click on this, copy link, boom. And then when you go to your assignment submission, just paste that link in there. And then we can open up your document and read your answers. But like I said, I saw people that'll just open up a blank document and they type the whole thing and then they put it into a folder and they put the link to the to their uh, folder for their Google Drive. That works I have a too. question. Yeah. Um, when you do the, I, for some reason I got you on full screen. I can't see what you were doing, but are you supposed to edit that Google what Doc? Do you mean, are you supposed to? Okay, so you have the questions. Where do you write your answers? Do you like go underneath? You can just here. Like I said, okay. like right here. I mean, you can go. You know, here's your first question. What type of menu? Okay, static, answer it right there. All right. Static menu. Boom, boom, boom. Give it a little more description. Yada, yada, yada. If you could put it in a different colored font, that always makes it easier to read when you're going through these, you know, but it's not necessary. Okay. But yeah, just type your answer right at the end of the question. And then okay. it's all in that document. And then you just share the share the link for your assignment submission. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I just didn't know you edited it then. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Nope. Martha, you got a question? Yeah, I'm kind of new to this uh, menu thing. I don't really understand what you mean when you say static menu. I have no idea if the term it means... doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, static menu oh, means it pretty much stays the same all the time. Okay. As opposed right. to like a, a daily menu, a seasonal menu, you know, okay. those kind of things, right? An a la carte right. menu where everything's listed by the each. You know, you see that in fine dining restaurants, but you also see it, like I said, in bakeries. A la carte menus work great in bakeries because Typically, everything's sold by the, each of the pieces, you know, or, you know, you want one donut, you can buy one donut. If you want six, you buy six, but everything's listed by the price, a la carte, right? All right, great. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Blake. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, I've noticed, because I've worked in a lot of bakeries, um, sometimes they'll have like a combination of menus, because yeah. a lot of bakeries will serve bread, and they serve a lot of the same breads every day, like baguettes, batards, and things like that. And there's some pastries that they'll serve during certain times of the year. And it's generally because certain ingredients are only available during that time right. of year. So they may sell like strawberry tarts, lemon tarts, and things like that. But only during certain times of the year because, you know, lemons only bloom during certain times of the year, strawberries certain times of the year, things like that. So with, like I said, with bakeries, they tend to use a little bit of both. So, yeah. and they also do a la carte kind of things. Absolutely. You know, you, you, 
you know, once you create, you get that clientele, you have people, you know, you're probably on any menu, you know, even with seasonal menus. I mean, I always had some staple items, you know, that stayed, you know, um, I like to change most of the menu, but yeah, you, you know, like bakers, like you said, I mean, probably going to have some of those staple things, but yeah, like you said, uh, uh, ingredients that are available, you cycle through those kinds of things, you know? Um, so it can, it, it, and again, it all kind of depends on the situation and what you're trying, who your market is. And, you know, if you're a bakery that's utilizing those local ingredients, I would definitely not expect to see the same menu year round. Um, especially, you know, special occasion menus, you know, like I said, people don't eat the same thing necessarily in the dead of summer that they're eating in the winter time, right? And people, if you go into a bakery and those special occasions, there's just things that people expect, you know, with those special occasions. So you have to accommodate that, right? Customers' expectations. Expectation. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I have a question. Uh, is the live session going to be every uh, Thursday at five in the evening, Central yep. Standard Time? Yep. Okay. Or is there a steady hall? Yes. And that's, yes. And that's final thing. Final thing. What's, going What's going on here? In my back. Okay. Um, yes, we are going to do study halls and they're going to typically be on Mondays at two o'clock central time. Okay. However, Monday's a holiday this week, right? So this week is a weird week. We're doing our study hall tomorrow. Okay. If it's, I think, there, I don't think there's anything else to the block, but I'll have to check. And I always give you guys a heads up the week of if, if it's a weird day, but if you want to come to study hall tomorrow, we're doing study hall at two o'clock central time. After the holiday weekend, they'll just go back to Mondays. And like I said, um, I will, we typically try to give you guys the heads up, but you know, on those holidays, everybody wants off. You guys want off, we want off. So we try to, you know, make it happen for everybody. So study hall is tomorrow. Next week, it'll go back to Mondays. And like I said, I mean, you know, it, it you know, if you aren't able to make it, we do archive those. Um, the study halls are great. They're casual. I love the study halls because it just opens up some nice conversation. Um, if there's not a lot of questions, we usually just talk about food and stuff like that and whatever, you know, but if you have questions, that's a great place to show up. You can pop in, pop out, whatever. We try to keep them to like a half an hour. So it's pretty quick. Come with your questions. So the, and that's study why halls the pastry chefs are really fun. What's that? I said this, I'm in the baking and pastry program. And I was going to say that the, uh, study halls that we do with the pastry chefs they are a lot of fun yeah it's like way more casual you know it's just fun we just talk about food questions and that's also another thing you know be proactive and look ahead you know after we get done with our live session and you look at your assignment you know get a jump on it look at it you know and that way you know if it's if it's clear if you have any questions i mean you can certainly reach out but that study hall is a great way you know to answer those questions so do yourself that favor and look ahead and see what you need to worry about and focus on uh sabrina so um i am gonna ask this because uh my screen and everything is really wonky um so if i'm unable to join the study hall because i currently am working and working on getting a manager position over at my job uh is there another way i can contact you yeah i mean you can on the class page is our phone number you can call you can text that phone number send us an email message us on the class page you know, you can certainly ask questions anytime during the week besides study hall. We're not saying that you can't, you know, that's the only place you can ask questions. If you get done tonight and you have some questions, you can certainly send me an email. I'm not saying I'm going to get right back to you at 10 o'clock at night. You'll probably hear back from me tomorrow, but certainly ask questions anytime during the week. We're here available to help you guys out. So we can watch the replay right. too, right? Yep. There's the, the study halls and the live sessions all archived. And they'll be okay, on the Sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. It's all good. Okay. No worries. So yeah, um, you know, so take advantage, help us help you. Like I said, I mean, we're pretty available most of the time, but you know, we also have lives too. So, I mean, I typically do check in on, on the weekend because I realize that people, you know, everybody has different schedules. Some people are doing their assignments on the weekends. I don't necessarily have office hours, but I check in because I know people have questions. So, you know, if it's a weird time, feel free to reach out. I, I have people text me at one o'clock in the morning. I don't hit them back um, until the next day, but, you know, at least they get their question answered, you know, so just be reasonable. Don't expect a response back in the middle of the night or anything like that, but certainly reach out anytime. All right. 
So I guess on that note, if you guys have any more questions, we're going to cut it. We're going to cut it off here. We went a little past, but like I said, I mean, everybody plans on an hour. So we try to keep it in an hour. Everybody has lives. So that's about all I got for tonight. Like I said, we kind of blasted through it and we're going to get a little more in depth each week about more specific things about menus and go over them a little more in depth, we'll cover <laughs> stuff a little more in depth. So um, that's all I got. Chef, you got anything you want to add before we get out of here? Just wanted to add or uh, a tip for those when you're submitting your discussion forums, it, if it might take you, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to write it down. I always recommend you write your answers in a separate file and then copy paste it into the page because sometimes you're typing and typing and typing and maybe the page times you out when you hit save, it's not gonna save it, it's gonna kick you out. So if that's the case, I always recommend just typing it on another, uh, um, file and then just copy paste it paste it and post it that has happened to me several times but i've found out that if you go right to the top of where you were typing it'll save it in a draft all right there you go oh, nice there you go yeah and i mean you know even just take a look at the discussion and give it a day or two to think about it you know and go in there but you know try to get your initial posts in there you know by the weekend at least and that gives it opportunity to create a discussion i mean Technically, you know, you have till 11.59 Tuesday night is like on time, but if you do it at the last minute, it really doesn't create a lot of conversation. So it kind of defeats the purpose. Or, you know, if we're so, in week five and you're going back into week one discussion, you know, you'll get credit for it, but what's the point? <laughs> you know what I mean? Not, so not, we could type it up in like Word document? You're going to type it right in the discussion forum. Okay. What Chef's saying is you can type it in your own document until you get it, you know, dialed out the way you want it and then you can just copy it and, and paste it right into the discussion yeah okay. yeah so all right guys well that's it for tonight study hall tomorrow if you make it you make it if not everybody have a good holiday weekend and we'll see you back here thursday thanks chef good night chef <laughs>